The Biden administration is preparing to designate the Iranian-backed Houthis as a terrorist group, what it means for humanitarian aid to the people in Yemen. Produced by Defense News and Military Times, this is the Early Bird Brief. Each morning we bring you the defense and national security news of the day. Reckless attacks by the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, including the use of anti-ship ballistic missiles, have threatened freedom of navigation in one of the world's most vital waterways. And the Space Force will become the first U.S. military service to allow part-time troops. What does it all mean for our defense and security? You'll find out. I'm your host, Simone Perez. Today is Thursday, January 18th, 2024. First up, the Biden administration is expected to announce plans to redesignate Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen as specifically designated global terrorists. It comes as the Houthis have launched dozens of attacks on commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The group says it has attacked the ships in response to Israel's military operations in Gaza in the aftermath of Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. Three people familiar with the decision were not authorized to comment and requested anonymity to discuss the matter with the Associated Press. Here's why it matters. Secretary of State Antony Blinken delisted the Houthis as both a foreign terrorist organization and as specifically designated global terrorists in February 2021. This was an attempt by the administration to make it easier to import humanitarian aid into Yemen. The change reversed the designation made in the last days of the Trump administration, which drew condemnation from human rights groups. The two labels did have serious legal implications. The foreign terrorist designation keeps Americans and people and organizations subject to U.S. jurisdiction from providing, quote, material support to the Houthis. The specially designated global terrorist label that will be reimposed on the Houthis does not include sanctions for providing material support. It also does not come with travel bans that are also imposed with the foreign terrorist organization label. Those steps are intended to help prevent the U.S. from harming ordinary Yemenis. Another reason why it matters? Yemen is the poorest country in the Arab world. The United Nations says war and chronic misgovernment have left 24 million Yemenis at risk of hunger and disease, and about two-thirds of Yemenis live in territory controlled by the Houthis. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke about the Red Sea conflicts at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. The answer to your question about how long this goes on and how bad it gets comes down not just to the decisions of the countries in the coalition that took strikes last week, But the broad set of countries, including those with influence in Tehran and influence in other capitals in the Middle East, making this a priority to indicate that the entire world rejects wholesale uh, the idea that a group like the Houthis can basically hijack the world as they are doing. He also acknowledged that the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea posed concerns that the Israel-Hamas war could escalate, despite Israeli officials saying they're lowering the intensity of their military campaign in northern Gaza. We have to guard against and be vigilant against the possibility that, in fact, rather than heading towards de-escalation, we are on a path of escalation that we have to manage. And we are doing this not just by ourselves, but with a large collection of countries both in the region and beyond, and it remains a central locus of our strategy. Another important story, the Space Force will now allow for part-timers. It's part of the service's broader vision to adapt military service to the needs of modern Americans. For more on this, Military Times reporter Jonathan Lairfeld joins the episode today. So can you tell us about this recent change for the Space Force? Yeah, so the Space Force will become the nation's first military service that allows troops to switch between full-time and part-time work without formally transferring to a reserve component or the National Guard. That's because of language in the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act that was signed into law by President Joe Biden in December. So what does that all mean? Well, the youngest branch of the armed forces has lacked its own part-time workforce since it was created in 2019. And this eliminates for them the traditional component structure, which separates troops serving on active duty from those in reserve or guard units. It aims to offer more flexibility for those looking to serve their country and ultimately keep them in uniform longer. And this move comes also after a report last year found issues linked to transition challenges for guardians moving to and from part-time roles in the other services, like the Air National Guard or the Air Force Reserve. Basically, now Guardians will become classified as serving on sustained duty, 
meaning a regular full-time status, or as not on sustained duty, meaning like a part-time position. It's a phased implementation that's expected to last five years. And experts told me this could be a test bed for the larger military to create a more modern personnel system and a true continuum of service. And so I know a lot of folks have been arguing for the creation of, of a Space National Guard. Is that still on the table? Yeah, there's been a long-running fight to create a separate Space National Guard. Those opposed to it say it doesn't make sense to have this at the state level and that it would cost too much, and those in favor of it say it actually will not cost that much and the guard structure is the best model for the force. There are actually currently about a thousand National Guard soldiers and airmen performing space-related operations across more than a dozen units. If and when a Space Force National Guard component gets created remains to be seen, but Congress did ask for a feasibility study and cost report in that latest defense policy law. Also on your radar for today, the Navy is revamping its policy when assigning pregnant sailors shore duty. But how will that impact pregnant sailors? Navy Times reporter Diana Stancy joins us now with the latest on that. So Diana, could you tell us what the previous policy was like and how that differs from the newest changes? Yes. So right now the Navy has changed its pregnancy policy so that sailors who become pregnant during sea duty can be moved to critical shore job openings. So this is a departure from the previous policy where pregnant sailors were reassigned to shore duty billets primarily based on what assignments were open near them at their current duty station. So there wasn't a whole lot of shifting in terms of, um, you know, geolocation going on under the previous policy. But one thing that Navy officials say the old policy didn't focus on enough was matching a sailor's skill set with their personal choices as far as filling these critical billets. So that's important because as of November, there were roughly 14,000 billets gapped ashore. However, officials say that those numbers do fluctuate a bit given certain changes such as a permanent change of duty station, ship decommissionings, or ships moving into a maintenance availability. Then what's the goal of this policy then, and how will it impact pregnant sailors and their families? So right now, Navy leaders are claiming that this change is designed to provide sailors a chance to choose jobs that also advance their career while also being able to start a family. So what this means is that pregnant sailors serving on sea duty can take on shore duty billets for at least two years at a location where they can get the proper medical care that they need, while also making sure that they're taking on jobs that ensure that their naval careers stay on track. So what naval leaders have said recently is that the ultimate goal is that sailors don't have to choose between having a successful career or having a family. Additionally, the policy also aims to give sailors some more flexibility in terms of where they are stationed. For example, that means that sailors could shift duty stations if a critical shore duty billet is open at another command, even from San Diego to Norfolk if the fit was right. And now here's some other stories that we're hearing chirps about. A judge yesterday declined to dismiss the case against a Marine veteran charged with manslaughter for placing a man in a deadly chokehold aboard a New York City subway train. Military.com reported that a Marine base in Guam, quote, disabled a drone flying over the installation earlier this week. It prompted a Naval Criminal Investigative Service inquest and a warning to the public that unmanned aerial systems are prohibited on Defense Department property. Bloomberg reported that OpenAI, which is behind the popular artificial intelligence ChatGBT, is working with the Pentagon on a number of projects, including cybersecurity capabilities. It's a departure from the startup's earlier ban on providing its artificial intelligence to militaries. And the Defense Department announced yesterday it will install solar panels on the Pentagon. It's part of the Biden administration's plan to promote clean energy. And on this day in history, in 1919, the Paris Peace Conference convened in an effort to begin establishing the terms of peace after World War I. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode featured stories by the Associated Press, Jonathan Lairfeld, and Diana Stancy. Our editor-in-chief is Mike Gruse. Have a great day. <laughs>